What if you need to get a value without an index? Maybe by some key or by some unique identifier? Well, I think you need HashMap, and we're going to look at that today. My name is Ricky, and this is the dev method. The data for the hash map is very similar to vectors, where the data for it is actually stored on the heap. It's one of the collections inside of the standard library for collections, but it's not in the prelude. So that means we actually have to bring it into scope before we can use it. Now, the whole idea of a hash map is that we're going to have some sort of key value pair. And in some languages, they call it a dictionary. Um, object could be another one, a map. Um, but hash map implies that there's a particular way that it's implemented. So the idea with the hash map is that you have some sort of key, something that uh, is unique, and then you have one value per key. So let's think of an analogy. So let's say we have um, a list of contacts on our phone. And as soon as we have one of those contacts that we want, we can tap on it or click on it, and then we can see the telephone number. So this is the same idea as the hash map, where the key is that person in the list, that contact list, and then accessing its value is getting the phone number. So if you stick around to the end, I'll show you how to use your custom data types as a key to the hash map. So let's create our first hash map. In this example here in line 19, this is where we bring it into scope. And uh, line 22, we're creating the new hash map. Um, we're actually creating a mutable version of this hash map. So we're using uh, let mute scores. And then this is empty currently. So that's what this is showing us. And then we have scores.insert. And then the key is actually going to be a string. And then the value is going to be an i32. So you could think of it like this. So with that type inference, this is actually what we're getting behind the scenes. And it's inferring the type because we started using it within the same uh, context here. So it just knows it's a string to i32 pairing. So notice about um, this initializer or this constructor for the hash map. Uh, it's, it has no built-in macro, like how we do uh, vectors or, or vec. And an important thing to note is that all the keys must be the same type. So you can't have some of the keys be integers and some of them be strings or any other type. They have, all have to be the same type, and all the values have to be the same type as well. Now, I've inserted some new code here because I want to show you. Um, we have teams here, which is a vector, and it's a vector of strings. And then we have the scores. So you can think of teams as like all the keys, and you can think of initial scores as the i32, just uh, all, the, all the values. So then in line 30, this is our let mute scores that we're creating again. Uh, but this time, we're using a slightly different technique. Um, so it's really kind of the same thing. Um, we have teams, and then we have dot into iterator. So one of the iterator functions that we have is zip. So that takes an iterator of the values. And then we use this special thing called collect. So if we have collect, it's like making a hash map for us. It's, so this is very similar to lines 24 and 25. So types that implement the copy trait that you're putting into the hash map, uh, their values are automatically copied for you into the hash map. So like with our example we had um, a moment ago, we had i32 as the value. All those values being put in there are copies. Now for other types like string, uh, string actually uh, it does not implement the copy trait. So therefore, the string keys are actually owned by the hash map. So let's take a look at this example. Um, we have here our field name, and then we have our field value. Both are strings, so both are actually owned by the hash map. Now, if we tried to use them after line 26, uh, it would actually be invalid. So I'm going to do a cargo check on this just to show you this example here. Line 29, we should get an error. So there it is, value borrowed after a move. So now you might be thinking, well, um, if it's borrowed and maybe we, uh, or we want to try and borrow this value into the hash map, then we'd have to use something like references to do that. But if we did references, then we'd also be forced to use a feature in Rust called lifetimes. Therefore, whatever we're putting into the map has to be guaranteed that it exists for the lifetime uh, of the hash map itself. So lifetimes are in chapter 10 of the Rust programming book. So if you want to read ahead or take a look at it, you may. But we're not going to talk more about that than this. So now let's say we want to actually get one of the values back from our hash map. So let's take a look at this example. 
So uh, line 22 makes that new empty hash map and it's mutable. So we're gonna insert some things into it, just like how we've done before. But now the next thing is that, uh, let's say we have blue again. Notice this is a different string instance here. So we have 27 and we're saying, okay, so get that. Get something that matches what blue is as a key and get the score out of it. So now this type that we're actually getting out of here is not just the score itself, because what if it didn't exist? What if instead of blue, this said uh, pink? So now if we're asking you to get blue with this get method, well, we don't have a blue value, what would happen? So it turns out that this is actually going to be an option I32. And that's really important for us because it forces us to handle the cases where we don't actually find a value that's inside our hash map. So we could use pattern matching or if let. I have some other videos on that. If you want to take a look, I'll have a, a link in the description for you. So let's try iterating through a hash map. So when we iterate through our hash map, notice here we have scores again, line 22 insert our items just as we did before. But now um, we say we want to iterate over a reference to scores. And each value that we get in the for in loop is actually going to be a tuple. And the first value is the key. And the second value of the tuple is the value. So this is that key value pair that is in the hash map. And here, what this code is doing is just printing out every single key value pair. Now, something to keep in mind is that the order is not guaranteed on the keys. So we're not always going to get blue because blue is inserted first as the first key in the first iteration of this loop. So there's no guaranteed order. Let's talk about updating the hash map. So with this example, I'm just going to run this, and you're going to see what's in scores. So notice here we have a key of blue and a key of blue. So what's the final hash map going to look like? Well, let me run it, and we'll check it together. All right, so the final answer is that it's 25. And that's because it was last inserted with that key. So if we were to flip these around and have 10, now if we run this, we're going to have 10. Because that's the last value that was put into the hash map. So now let's take that example a step further and look at what it would be like to try and insert the same key value pair, but we don't want to override that value. So in this example, let's say line 23, we inserted blue. Then we do some other inserts, but now we have uh, line 26. What if we were to insert blue again, but this time we don't want to override it. We say if blue does exist, then don't put anything in there. There are some programming languages where they don't have some of these built-in functions or these built-in constructs to help you with this particular scenario. So if we look at this, we have the entry, this new method entry. Then we say, OK, for blue, I want you to uh, insert 50. But if it already has a value, don't insert it again. So let's run this, and let's see what it looks like in the end. All right, so cargo run. So notice blue is 10 still. That was the first value we added in. But because we use this dot entry, then we give it the key of blue. Then we check to say, or insert 50. All right, let's take this a step further, and let's talk about modifying some of the values in the hash map. So here I, on line 24, I have my new hash map called map. And then I just have this example text. And what we're going to use is uh, on, on this string, we're just going to split the white space, so each one of these words. And you can think of this now as like a vector or an array um, of just those words, one at a time, through each iteration of the loop. So in line 26, when I get that word, what I do is I say, OK, if the word is not already in the hash map, because we're using entry here, I want you to insert 0. Then give me the count back, or that value back. So this first iteration through the loop, and we get hello, we're actually going to get 0 for the count. And then we're going to dereference count so that remember that these are actually references to that value that's in that hash map. So now if I was to take the count, I dereference it, and then I want to stick back inside uh, an increment of 1. So 0 plus 1, 
this on the first iteration will be one. Now, the case that you might have jumped to already is on line 22. Looking back at the original uh, text here where we split the white space, I have world twice. So that means the first time it's going to work just like how hello did. But then the second time, when we get to this last world, it's going to say or insert, and it's going to say, well, we already have something, so we're not going to insert zero. We're just going to give back one again. So then count is one, and then we increase that by one, so then we'll have two. So let me run this and show you how that works out. All right, so here it is. So we have world twice, but then we have hello once, then we have uh, wonderful once. Now, a little bit of background here with the hash map is that we need to know what the hash part actually means. And that is referring to the key and the hash map. So, so far we've been using strings, but um, the idea here is that we want to know what's the algorithm used. And so what, what is being used, and you'll see this in the Rust programming book, is that there's something called a SIP hash. Um, the reason why it's used is that uh, it actually is a data structure that is that can resist denial of service attacks which is really important in security for programming, of course. Uh, but there's a trade-off. It comes at the cost of performance. You can actually choose to make your own hasher if you want, and there's a bunch of others uh, out there. There's other libraries with different hashes. Um, you can get them on crate.io. And essentially what you're going to use, um, all these hashers implement the build hasher. And this build hasher is a trait, and that's going to be talked about again in Chapter 10 of the Rust programming book, these traits. So if you don't want to implement your own hash from scratch, just go out online and look for a new one or just use the built-in one. It's really up to you and it's really up to the use case of what you're putting your code through. All right, so now here's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're going to take a look at making our own key from our own custom data structure. So here on this example, um, I have a struct called person. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to insert person as a key and then we're going to uh, use phone number as the value. So the, the way you can do this really quickly is that um, if you use partial equality, equality, or EQ, then hash as your derived traits on the struct, then you're going to be able to use that as a key. So I have an example down below, and I'll show you that now. So here I have uh, the first one where it says Ricky on line 36, and then on line 38, I insert Ricky as the key, but for this value. So I'm just giving it uh, any old struct of what I call a phone number. And then we have here 41, right? So like this is our example that I talked about in the beginning. Um, we're going through each contact in the list. So that's our, our uh, key. And then we're going to print them out with the phone number. So if we want to get to Ricky, we're going to get his phone number. If we want to get to Arik, then we get his phone number. So that's the idea. So let me run this now as an example, and then you'll see how this turns out. All right, so I have some warnings here, uh, but we're not going to worry about that. First thing here is uh, there it is. There's uh, the first key value pair. So it actually paired, um, even though we inserted Ricky, again, there's no guaranteed order, uh, it actually showed Arik first. And then it showed Ricky as the second thing in the iteration of the array. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. Otherwise, I'll see you later.